Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and I'm with Audrey Waters, and it's the 29th of June, 2012. And Audrey, you're in a Marriott in San Francisco. I am. <laughs> and I'm in a Marriott in New York. And so lovely to see you, though, at ISTE. Yes, the, apparently the conference circuit, tour circuit for us, uh, continues for us, but it was great to see you in San Diego. Yeah, really a lot of fun. We recorded our podcast last week uh, on Friday just before the uh, Social Ed Con um, in that actual room and uh, had a very fun conversation. And I'm afraid that we're actually going to end up talking about ISTE a fair bit today. I think we will. <laughs> so general impressions. You know, one of the things I think that struck me the most, and I, and I, it's always interesting to think about an event like ISTE in terms of both the attendees and the exhibitors in who can afford to go. Um, and I think it, it's it's particularly interesting too when the the economy you know downturn in the economy, um, school budgets certainly being at, um, being cut, and the the kinds of um, the kinds of options that teachers might have had at one time to get their schools to pay for them to a professional development trip, those kinds of opportunities are are largely gone, and so. And then on the other side, you know, the exhibitors have to think as well about is it really worth it to spend a lot of money on a booth, to fly out a bunch of people to staff the booth, um, to prepare to give away tchotchkes in your booth. So um, considering that, I was actually really surprised at how big the event was because these are tough times and we're seeing several years of tough times now. And I was, I was really surprised that it was so well attended both by... Uh, educators as well as by exhibitors. There certainly feels like there may actually be a trend here as well because iPad adoption is driving a lot of the dialogue and I'm guessing attendance. I think that's true. I mean, that was certainly a couple, the things that I, that I heard um, spoken about most were uh, the flipped classroom, game-based learning, and I think and and iPad and iPad apps, and I think that you could also tie game-based learning and the flipped classroom to um, to um, to having mobile devices uh, as well. So it definitely seemed like the iPad seemed to be for many for many people there the most what they wanted to learn about, what they wanted to talk about, and certainly what I saw a lot of people using as well. Yes, boy. Has the tide turned? The, the, you know, the number of uh, those of us still using a PC feel like we're in the dark ages. It's interesting because you know, spending a lot of time in Silicon Valley, where really you do see, I mean, Apple has long been sort of ubiquitous here in terms of the kinds of machines that that folks use um, in the tech industry. But you go you go elsewhere, and you do still you do still see people um, using PCs. You see. You see the odd folks who still use a BlackBerry, <laughs> um, but I definitely noticed that Apple once again seems to be the predominant um, technology in the hands of educators. So I didn't have great success with the keynotes. I'm going to end up watching them later online, uh, just because of the some of the things I have to do to prepare there. But also, I was in the wrong place to hear well Sir Ken's uh, in- introductory panel. But it did feel like sort of unfortunately commercialism crept right in quickly. That was, I mean, that's certainly, I think that that's a fine line that ISTE has always struggled with. I mean, you know, in order to put on an event of this size and keep the, both the, the, the cost of attending ISTE so low, but then also the cost of being a member of ISTE fairly low. I mean, somebody subsidizes that and it is the, the, the corporate sponsors and the, the showroom floor. But I've never really felt before this year quite so sort of affronted with that message during the keynotes. And so I think for a lot of people it was um, it was pretty shocking. I think the juxtaposition with Sir Ken was part of the difficulty, <laughs> yes. right? And I think that he was expect. I mean, I think a lot of folks were hoping or that he would offer a counter narrative. I mean, which he does. He offers an important counter narrative to the way in which. Um, sort of the education system is heading in this country. And it, he felt it, or it felt as though he wasn't, he didn't really fully articulate that on stage, partially because he was par- a part of a panel, um, but partially too because that, that message about, you know, buy a Texas Instruments calculator um, seemed to trump uh, 
um, Sir Ken's message about student create honoring student creativity. So uh, Gary Steger was fairly outspoken about uh, <laughs> Gary. The, uh, well, yes, <laughs> surprise, surprise. You know about a membership organization depending so heavily on commercial. Um, companies to provide financial support. Do you think that's an accurate criticism? I think, I mean, I think that this is a really, I think that ISTE is really at an important um, moment because a lot of the things that ISTE has done in the past, I mean, and I think we talked about this last week too, a lot of the things that ISTE's offered in the past don't seem to be um, the, the direction in which sort of the world is going. You know, the public. You know, publications, publishing companies are certainly struggling. Um, that the the necessity of joining a membership organization in order to meet with people is certainly. You know, we can. You can meet with people on Twitter. You can talk online without having to have something mediated through. Uh, you know, through a membership organization like ISTE. So the corporate piece. I think the corporate piece is is where ISTE is. You know, might might be turning more and more. And I think that particularly as ISTE tries to be a voice lobbying the government for more support for education technology, that's a fine line that they're going to walk when it looks as though they're actually not really lobbying for education, uh, for teaching and learning, but they're lobbying for corporate dollars to be spent on hardware and software. Interesting. Okay, so... Uh, I love that you gave a lot of time and attention to the sort of social ed con activities. Uh, I don't know if that was by design or just that those were more engaging for you. Well, you but know, honestly, did- that was really, I, I, and I think, I, I think I speak for a lot of people that that always feels like a really special day, partially because it's the those present who decide what we talk about. Um, and I sort of carved out the day to go to those sessions in a way that once the conference proper starts, it somehow gets a lot more difficult to go to sessions. You end up spending time in the bloggers cafe or, 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 you know, socializing and the session, the social ed con sessions were really the only sessions I felt like I participated in. That makes me a bad attendee, I suppose. Well, no, it's good. And I think in part, you know, the reason that I call it is the unplugged is it's kind of that you're unplugging the amplifier. You're not you know, you're in a more informal setting and you get a chance to kind of jam with your friends. And that's my hope is that that's what hap- that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. No, I think it is. Okay. So tell me what an education entrepreneur is. This was a, this was an interesting session that I think David Warlick actually proposed. Um, and what, what really struck me was the, the group talking about it seemed to be talking about how the things that teachers do in the classroom and within their school buildings that are very entrepreneurial, um, as opposed to actually talking about entrepreneurs who work in the education industry or uh, create products to sell to teachers or students or schools or parents. And so it was a, it was a funny conversation because on one hand, you know, could hear teachers talk about the struggles to be entrepreneurial, to take risks, to be the person, to do something unique or different in their school. Um, but then it, we didn't seem to sort of spend a lot of time talking about what I think is more of a hot but- button issue, which is um, the, this question of this really explosion in the last couple of years of um, ed tech entrepreneurship, whether there's whether particularly around, I think too around uh, TFA students who are doing their two years in a classroom and then leaving teaching to start their own businesses. So, was in that particular session was the word entrepreneurial or for internal activities that are just sort of different and break the mold, or actually entrepreneurial in the sense of creating a small business? I think that they were really about this this notion of um, of of entrepreneurial as the adjective in the classroom, thinking about teachers, but then also I think we talked too about helping students gain those skills, those entrepreneurial skills that they'll need in their lives, which, again, isn't so much about students starting their own businesses, but students really having to learn how to, how to sell and market themselves in, in ways um, that I think, you know, a changing economy is really demanding. There's a different set of expectations of how you 
find a job or what jobs are even going to look like once students graduate from, from high school or college. So I really like the parallel between the student experience, the student as agent making yes. choices, and the teacher or educator experience of making choices, being an agent. Um, I, I'm struggling. I'm wondering. I mean, I'm wondering if entrepreneurial is the word we're going to land on because it didn't feel to me that that's necessarily the word I would have used, but I don't have a good other one to use. No, and I, I think that that's, I agree with you there, and because I felt as though, you know, I think that, you know, to be an entrepreneur is, to me, I think it is, the, the risk that you take often has to do with, with money, um, and the goal is, if, is, you know, creating a, creating a successful or profitable business. And so I'm not sure that that's quite the right analogy that we want to use for a lot of reasons when we talk about, you know, when we talk about, you know, having initiative, being, making change, even taking risk, taking risk in the classroom um, is, is real. I mean, it's real in terms of, you know, uh, you know, teachers' jobs and, and, you know, taking risks with kids, I think, is, um, you know, is a different sort of risk, but I, but yeah, I agree with you. I'm not sure entrepreneurial doesn't feel like the right word, and to me, sometimes I worry that when we, if, particularly if we aren't actually talking about um, the role of for-profit companies in the education space, I think it's there's some danger of of a lie of not not making a clear distinction with what we're with what we're talking about. Interesting. Okay, so you went to another session called making education trend in media, mm -hmm. where I had a similar concern, not identical, but similar. Uh, and this was sort of how to get the story out. And I, I actually think I attended both of these sessions, or I know at least that I attended the education trend in media session where people went to two different places, or the session was held twice, I can't remember. Yeah, it was, yeah. But for me, I, I worry that the idea of trying to get the education story to trend in media may um, promote some of the wrong narratives mm -hmm. or lesser narratives for me. Did that come out at all in your version of the session? Yeah, and I think that this is, I mean, this. I think about this a lot, you know, particularly as, as a journalist, but I think in some ways I feel as though um, despite my own frustrations with the ways in which the mainstream media tends to get education wrong, focuses on stories um, that I, I'm not sure are an, ad, an accurate reflection of what's really happening in the classroom or what, you know, what teaching and learning looks like. I, I do think that because, the, because the, whole, you know, the whole news media is at an interesting point of change itself, I'm just not sure that we're spending our energy in the right places to chase that, to, to chase that particular story. I mean, I think that the power of social media, and that's teachers blogging and teachers actually sharing their own experiences themselves, um, sharing them on Facebook, sharing them on Twitter, being their own PR is, is, is more interesting to me. I mean, I'm just not sure we're ever going to sort of win over the Wall Street Journal or win over 60 Minutes, win over CNN to tell the stories that we want to hear. And I think being... You know, being too concerned with that, I'm just not sure is the right the right place to focus. Okay, I'm glad that you had that reaction because that was definitely my reaction. Mm -hmm. um, but it does raise a very interesting question, which is, uh, you know, what is the narrative that we use around education? It does seem like there's value in helping to move that narrative. You know, certainly the narrative of uh, job creation is an, is part of the current narrative around education. The, the the narrative around equity doesn't seem to want to take hold right. for us, but it's obviously an important one. Uh, where what what can we do to help kind of move that narrative? Well, I mean, I th I think that you know I think the part of it is you know talking about what talking about our own experiences. I mean, as educators and perhaps as parents as students, um, sharing them. I think that you know. Things like question, you know, questioning the sort of the madness over standardized testing. I think it's hard if if you're aiming that if you're aiming that discussion at the national level, you sound very reactionary and defensive about the the, the teaching profession. 
Um, and that, that's often what teachers are accused of, I think, when they try to offer a counter narrative um, in the mainstream media. So I do think that it actually has to be having discussions in smaller circles with people that you know. I mean, I think reaching out, a, a parent is going to have a very different reaction to standardized testing, noticing the way in which it upsets their own child, than, you know, again, worrying about how can you convince, you know, how can you convince um, the morning news shows to, to tell a different story about standardized testing. So that raises a really interesting question, which is if the if there's real value in those local conversations, mm -hmm. what's the lever or what are the levers that levers that would get you to ha people being being able to or holding those conversations? So does that bring us to a narrative of non-federal local control? Is that is that part of the need? Where, where, how would you sort of draw that equation out? I do think. I mean, I think that the, I think that this is a really important thing to think about. I mean, I do think it's local. I think it's about the community. I think that you know. I think that people and and interestingly, you know, the the Gallup poll that I think you know that that has always said people say the U.S. school system is failing, but they like their local schools. They like, the te they like their kid's teacher. And I'm not sure how we can flip some of these larger conversations, particularly when they're being driven by corporate, uh, corporate interests and policy interests at the federal level. Um, so I do think we have to, in some ways, we have to focus these discussions locally and Hope that the lo you know, hope that local control and local, at least sort of a local awareness is, um, is more powerful. And I think that that's, I think that that's probably where you know where where teachers might have a better time getting their stories heard, um, as well. So I worry that there's a trap there, though. I go through oh, the same yeah. <laughs> thinking process, and I worry that the trap is that our sense of participation and community are come from our relatively middle class backgrounds and upbringing and that for schools that are in in poverty stricken areas that this isn't even really the first step for them right no i th i mean i think i think you're absolute i think you're absolutely right although i would say um i would say that the stories there perhaps um aren't about teachers and parents but they're about kids one of the folks I had a um, chance to talk with it um, in San Diego was Andrew Coy, who's who's part of the Digital Harbor Foundation in Baltimore now. And the real win, um, or one of the real wins that he's working on right now is getting teen mentors to do tech training for teachers. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the, the, tra the transformation there, which actually will, gr I mean, it's it will feed back into the Baltimore community. Um, it's 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 a lo it's local and community based, um, in a very different way than thinking about you know thinking about what appears in uh, you know on your local evening news. Dan Rather gave the keynote at the conference I'm currently at. It's the PGL 12 conference from Asia Society. Give a keynote this morning, and he mentioned that we, you know we're one of the only industrialized nations that actually funds its school system by property. We may be the only by property tax, which is highly unequal. Right. Um, and he got many, many parts of the sort of the educational story right from my perspective, mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like that's a really hard issue. Yeah. Okay. Then you you participated in a conversation about online writing. I did. I mean, and this is something that I, I find, I mean, of course, again, you know, as that's someone who writes online, I'm really interested in how we think about how we, and who's taught writing in the past. I am interested in the kinds of writing that we ask students to do. And, you know, that, that five paragraph paper that st we still seem to sort of obsess about, um, both at K-12 and, and in higher ed, that doesn't seem to have a lot of connection to what, um, to what students actually, how students actually need to write in the future that for their sort of their professional careers but it doesn't it also doesn't reflect necessarily how they communicate and write with each other now um, and so one of the one of the teachers and I wish I knew who said this said that she thinks about writing instead of focusing on sort of this traditional format she thinks about teaching writing um, a number of other ways sort of how do you how do you write a review I mean knowing how to craft a review whether it's a Yelp review or 
a movie review um, is a pretty interesting and important skill. Think, again, thinking about online and writing for an audience online is different than writing for the audience of one, just writing something for your teacher. And so, you know, I mean, I think we, you know, I think we, we definitely need to help um, students find their voice, learn to write, learn to write well. Um, but I really feel like we, we sort of fail to recognize the ways in which they, they write now and help them, help them articulate their, um, their thoughts and feelings there, not just in the sort of formal academic writing. Yeah, I love that. Certainly they're writing way more in non-five-paragraph essay forms than I think I ever even wrote in traditional essays. Right. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, hundredfold. Right. I mean, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, even things, I mean, it's, it sounds so silly to say it, but like how do you craft a, a tweet? How do you craft a status update on Facebook? I mean, all that, I mean that sounds it sort of sounds anathemic to say that that's something that an English teacher should think about, but that absolutely is the way in which you perform and you articulate yourself, um, and and actually you know it actually matters professionally as well as personally um, how you express yourself that way. Well, and certainly that. 140 character tweet has all of the same elements of thought. Yeah. Right? Who's the audience? What might they be thinking about and how would they respond? How do I communicate clearly? How am I respectful? Right. Those are all parts of larger form writing, yep. but just the same elements. Right. Yeah. So uh, I had sort of an aha moment myself uh, giving a session at ISTE on Teacher 2.0. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about the value for students of having an authentic audience and how you know, people who actually respond to them can change how they think in their own writing. And it occurred to me that teachers need that same authentic audience. Yes. Right? And that's a very scary thing for a lot of educators. They're actually afraid of putting themselves out there for fear of being criticized. But if it's true for students, it's certainly going to be true for educators. Well, I mean, and I think that people often say, you know, use this as an argument for students not blogging, saying, too, that, you know, isn't it scary, like, wouldn't it be scary to sort of write for the world to, or, you know, write publicly? And I think that that's true. But again, the writing that you do as an adult is public writing. I mean, when you, you know, when you, when you craft an email to your company, Making and you have to sort of make a pitch for X, Y, or Z um, uh, sort of initiative at your at your office at your job. I mean that you do public writing. Very little writing is the sort of private sort of journaling or a, a, a private exchange between you and one other person who's never going to share that um, with anyone else. So maybe there's a little bit of brilliance in the way in which the web allows for authentic audiences so that educators are actually themselves practicing the same participation. I think so too. You know, with previously the barriers would be you'd have to get published in a journal or right. you know, some other kind of a place. But again, I'm sure this is really scary to educators, but it makes so much sense that they should be active participants in the same process. Absolutely. Okay, so... Did you like the after party? I did like the after party. <laughs> <laughs> how did how did Startup Weekend Edu do? You, were you comfortable with that? I actually got into a conversation with Adam Bello, and we were shushed. <laughs> we <laughs> <never heard it laughs> <at all. laughs> I think that Khalid is used to an audience that's just there for Startup Weekend. Yeah. And if I could have given him advice at that moment, it would have been, don't worry, not everybody has to be paying attention. Yeah. Aside from the shushing, how did you feel? <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was interesting. I mean, and it was it was really I thought it was a really interesting moment to sort of see uh, to, again, sort of thinking back to to the session that David proposed on you know on entrepreneur on, on educator entrepreneurs. There really seems to be a very awkward divide between but um, going on there, and I, and I'm not I'm not sure we've done a good job in sort of articulating articulating that. And again, this is one of the things that makes me cringe when I think that it, when the entrepreneur has to be about building a business that's going to make you money. So I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of tools that teachers would like to see built, a lot of hacks that they could perhaps learn to do themselves that are really actually outside the realm of what's your business plan and how are you going to, how are you going to start a, start a startup? 
I absolutely agree. I also find it really fun that educators could just stand up and say, I yes. wish that I had this. Yes. The perfect planner or whatever it was. Right. And I actually felt like that was very healthy and uh, kind of empowering because, no, it doesn't have to be for creating a business, but it's just this idea of agency. I could, I could create something that yes. didn't exist before. Um, we also, so part of that party was also the Study Blue apps kind of thing. And I felt like yeah. Study Blue did a really good job of not – <clears throat> self-promoting too much. Yeah, I think so too. Staying in the background. The the tweet that I liked was uh, from Brett Koff. Uh, the highest rated apps weren't custom for education. I think that that's, I think that, you know, of course, you know, Brett's, Brett's an entrepreneur. He's the co-founder of Remind 101. And I think that that's a really good lesson for startups to think about. When you look at the ones that, that teachers loved were Dropbox and Evernote. And those Neither of those, I mean, I, I would say Evernote, you know, Evernote had a booth, and Evernote, I think, does recognize that a lot of students and teachers use it, but clearly those apps solve a problem for, and I think that, you know, you have to solve a problem if you want your app to be adopted, and I think that um, it's something to, to recognize is that, is that you, that it's, it, this is really, using tools are about what works what solves a problem. It isn't necessarily just using it because it's being pitched to you as a teacher or student. I think we'll get to this when we talk about Google, mm -hmm. but it does feel like the best tools solve human problems yeah. and then educators bring them into education. And right. I, we've talked about this before. I really like that model. Yeah. Okay. So Sunday, I, I, I can't remember. Did you take the day kind of off? <laughs> I did. I didn't, I didn't. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I didn't attend, um, Anything except for I, I took a brief tour through the at the ISTE. They have the um, member networking event, partially because I knew that all the special ISTE special interest groups would be would have little booths, and I knew that was probably my one chance to see uh, to see folks before things got too busy. We did hold a global education summit, which was a form of an unconference mm -hmm. uh, Sunday for the first time ever as part of ISTE Unplugged, and that was a huge success. Great. And I, I love the idea that ISTE Unplugged is kind of growing this body of activities that ISTE's been so supportive of. Yeah. And, and I'm hoping that Anita's departure, you know, won't um, put a, uh, won't impinge on that at all. Yeah. Okay, Monday Ignite talks, a lot of Will Richardson tweets. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that Will, you know, Will, Will's good at getting the things down into those sort of... Um, very tweetable. He had a lot of very tweetable things, but I love, you know, the Ignite Talk, I think is, the Ignite Talk is a really great format. Um, you have five minutes, 20 slides, and those slides automatically advance. So it's a really condensed, and I think for, um, for, the, for the speakers, it's a really actually very intimidating format because you know you have to nail your presentation in a way that Particularly if you're if you're used to sort of speaking informally or even speaking in front of people, you can't you can't go off on tangents. You really have to stay on script, which is something that um, I don't think we do very often. So one of the things I actually loved about it was, you know, I mean, and Will is a good example. Here's somebody who you know actually has a career as a public speaker in a lot of ways, and was you could tell sort of visually uncomfortable delivering delivering this because of the the, for, the constraints of the format. And I think that that's actually, to me, that's really interesting because it it's, it's a, levels the playing field a lot to sort of be on stage with Will um, and to sort of see Will at a, um, you know, a vulnerable Will, I think, is a, is a pretty powerful thing. Not to, not to poke fun at Will or anything, but... No, but we've all been there. Yeah. So the, the um, part of what I hear you saying also is that this is sort of the power of ideas. Yes, yeah, and I and I think that you know the 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 ignite talk. I mean, I really hope this was the first year that ISTE did it, and I wasn't able to attend. They also did another ignite session on Tuesday afternoon that I, I didn't attend. But I hope that ISTE continues this because I I think it's I think it's a a really great thing. Okay, you had a number of sort of final thoughts, or at least I made notes of different final thoughts. Mm -hmm. One of which is that you felt like you didn't have a lot of stamina. Yeah. Well, I think that you know this is. You know, and I say this now having just wrapped up Google I.O., but there's something about the conference format that makes me love the unconference format and just find the con conference format really, 
tiring. I think it, partly it's sort of the obligations to do sessions, the number of people. Um, it's sort of a, and I think ISTE is always very overwhelming. Um, but I just felt, and sometimes you, I walk away from ISTE being really uh, energized and. I think that the, co the conferences just in general right now to me feel very draining. And I felt this way after South by Southwest um, as well. It's sort of exhausting. Well, in part, they are replicating the old classroom format, right? <laughs> they are indeed. Um, you like spending a lot of time with people offline. Certainly yes. that's something that, uh, that you've been clear about. Uh, you say the time to simply be a tech enthusiast is over. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that... You know, the, there were a lot of sessions, and I know that these are popular sessions um, that are sort of, uh, you know, 50 tools in, uh, 50 tech tools that you could use in your classroom. And I think that we need to sort of, I think we should just be a little bit more critical and thoughtful about what we're adopting and why. Um, I know that there still are struggles in a lot of places to, to convince teachers and to convince administrators that technology is something to use in the classroom. But even so, I feel like the, the pace of technological change is so fast and so rapid that, that those voices are sort of, I think those voices are getting smaller and smaller. So instead, I think the focus shouldn't just be, you must use technology in the classroom, but I think we must start to say, you must use technology wisely. You must adopt technology wisely. Um, because otherwise, the sort of overarching, being just being a cheerleader in general for tech seems... Um, I, guess, I mean, it seems dangerous even. If it's the closed doors, mm -hmm. something happened and they just said, we're shutting down, would someone step in to replace that role or would this just happen at the subject-specific conferences? I don't know. I mean, I think there seem to be a strong, you know, all of the ISTE affiliates that, are, that have their regional technology conferences um, I think that they would certainly continue, and I think that um, I think that, that things would continue. I mean, we've seen such an explosion with the popularity of ed camps. Again, I think that there's that people do recognize the importance, even around the subject of technology, which promises us online communication with any you know any connected person on the planet. There's something about that face to face to face time that is really important. Um, so I do think that something would continue in in some format, but I'm not sure that it would that I'm not sure that someone would sort of jump in with a big a big tech circus. Okay, so flip classroom was popular, the iPad, Common Core, game based learning, and surprisingly there was Chromebook buzz. There was Chromebook buzz. It was it was really interesting um, to notice that particularly in the exhibit hall. Um, the, the giveaways, there were iPad giveaways, um, but, but there, were, there were a lot of people giving away Chromebooks. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of teachers, too, um, talking about making the decision to go with Chromebooks. I mean, and these were, you know, I think for, class, for schools that are Google Apps for education users, the Chromebooks makes a lot of, the Chromebook decision makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I was... I was really surprised to hear a number from a number of places, people, again, coming back to my earlier comment, people starting to be a little bit critical about why the iPad maybe isn't the best solution for them, for their class, for their school. We're going to talk about the exhibit hall in a minute, but one of the things you were going to do was to look for startups. Mm -hmm. Were there startups that you saw on the exhibit floor? There were there were a lot of startups on the exhibit floor, and I also noticed there were a lot of startups in attendance. Um, so not necess not not there just to exhibit, but there to, um, I mean, well, obviously to sort of have an opportunity to talk face to face with their potential customers. But in the best in the best of worlds, also there to listen and learn. And I think that it was really interesting for me to observe the to observe the startups who. We're doing the listening and learning, and those who were really just doing selling. Yeah, I was really actually impressed with the startup groups that I met. Mm -hmm. They, uh, in some ways, their humility and willingness to integrate appropriately into 
a lot of the SD unplugged activities was impressive. Yes, I and I I like I mean I think that Brett um, Brett from Rewind, Remind One Hundred and One was a, a great example of that. I also noticed Meredith from Learn Boost, um, you know, attending sessions and learning, um, uh, and not not there to sort of tell everyone about their classroom management tools. I mean, I don't even know if she introduced herself as as a Learn Boost member of the Learn Boost team. Yeah, I was impressed. Now, I met Jesse Aurora for the first time. Mm -hmm. Do you know Jesse? Yes. So what's her role been in, in some of these startups? Uh, I think she's been an advisor to them and an investor. I know that she's an investor in several of the startups that were there, too. Yeah, I was just uh, impressed by everybody in, in that realm. Um, okay, uh, you say it was also the antithesis of Maker Fair. It was. I mean, I felt I I got a tweet um, yesterday from a teacher who did I think much like you was sort of scheduled to teach the last session on the last day of ISTE, um, and she said that she counted only four sessions that were actually about teaching kids to program. Four sessions out of eleven hundred sessions at the conference. And I, I definitely walked away with that feeling is that there was a lot of emphasis on buying tools, um, using tools, but really very, very little about building, kids building or teachers building. Um, and despite, I think, really this growing maker movement, I didn't feel that represented very much at all um, at ISTE, either in the sessions or in the exhibit hall. I mean, not entirely. There were Spark Fun, for example, had um, was in the exhibit booth, and they sell those little electronics for people to to hack on. Um, but it really felt as though there was very little of that going on. So you and I talked last week about having a Maker Day mm -hmm. at ISTE, and Karen Fassenpower seems to be talking the same language. It looks like she may actually even help make it happen. Yeah, I think that's great. So, so uh, I definitely think there might be some fun. Uh, you know, again, Gary Steger raises his vocal uh, opinions <laughs> and says we shouldn't be at ISTE at all. Do you feel like being at ISTE is any some kind of a compromise? If we were to do a Maker Day plus these other activities, should it be separated from ISTE? This is, I mean, this is a really hard, a hard one. You know, sort of this: be at ISTE, not be at ISTE. Sort of, are you implicated in these large sort of corporate? Um, you know, education corporations when you are there. Um, and I think the thing for me that I always go back to the importance of ISTE is, well, for me, you know, organizing conferences is hard. No conference ever is perfect. And no, you're never going to please anyone. And when you have 20,000 attendees, you're definitely going to make some people unhappy. Um, but I know that ISTE is the place where I can see, you know, see folks offline. And again, and until we have a, until there's really an alternative to that, and I, I think that there are a few events that seem, I mean, I would say, that, you know, Maker Fair perhaps would be one contingent, Educon perhaps another, your local ed camp. But there is something, I think, pretty powerful about knowing once a year, you know, you'll, you'll run into folks that you haven't seen except online. Okay, so you went to the exhibit floor specifically to ask about uh, access to APIs mm -hmm. and thinking about data portability. Yeah. Uh, what, what does this mean and why is it important to you? I, I think that, you know, once well, I actually had a, a completely unrelated to ISTE conversation with a mom when I was down in San Diego. And her, her daughter, um, her daughter's school, she's a middle schooler, had... Um, that was, this was their first year at I, using iPads. And at the beginning of the school year, the iPads were distributed to the students and, the, and the families were given the option to buy it. This particular family couldn't afford to and they weren't really convinced that it was a necessary um, purchase. I mean, it, it seemed like, it seemed to them like a luxury consumer um, electronic that had no, perhaps no educational value. Um, but by the end of the school year, seeing all of the things that her daughter had done with the device, all of the drawings, all of her assignments, all of her work, she said to the school, okay, actually, we've changed our mind. We'd like to, we'd like to buy the iPad now. Um, and the school said it was too late, and they gave the iPad back. And all that data, um, again, this, and this isn't, you know, we shouldn't, when we talk about education data, it's really not just 
test scores. Um, it's everything that this girl had done was on that iPad that had to be handed back to the school. And to me, that's, that's awful. I mean, imagine, you know, imagine not getting to take home. I mean, I still have, you know, I still have a drawing that I did in second grade that my mom saved. I can't imagine, you know, as we move to more and more of these digital tools for drawing and writing, to, to, not, to not have the opportunity to actually own that, to take it home and own that is, I think, um, it's a real travesty. And so I think that this no notion of data portability and student data ownership is really crucial, particularly as we adopt, whether they're s systems that schools adopt, um, in, um, administrative tools, or whether they're apps that teachers and students choose to adopt as themselves in the classroom. If a student can't get their data out, if a student can't own their data, to me it's a, it's a real problem and it's something we need to be a lot more aware of. So I'm going to ask the obvious here, but I can just plug my Android tablet into a PC and I can download all my data. Can you not do that with an iPad? Uh, you can if you have an if you have an Apple ID, you can, um, and some schools decide to create an individual ID that's tied to a student. Some of them use a generic ID that's just tied to the school. But even if you plug it in and you download all of your information, that's not really data portability because you, until you plug it into another and get another Apple device, you don't ever you can't access those apps again. It's not like that. It's not like you can crack open what's in those apps and pull out your drawings or pull out your the stories that you've written. It's all still in in um, and that's sort of, that's that's Apple's vendor lock in, and that's these apps sort of not really recognizing data portability either. So you can you can back it you can back it up, but unless you have another Apple device to download it onto, it's not it's not really sufficient. I'm not saying anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, I loved the tweet that you, so you went around asking vendors if they had an API. Right. Right. And uh, the one I loved was we don't, but we share student data with our partners, including Pearson. Love that one. Yeah. And one of them, you know, I love this. I love the one that said we track every click a student makes, but you can't export it. I mean, and again, this is, you know, if we're, if we are, and this is sort of more, this is really important. You know, this is this is the, these companies don't own this information. They might think they do, but this is really about you know student students owning their own clicks. You gave some shout outs to the companies that do have APIs or are working actively to provide this data. Yeah. Google and Structure, Schoology, Root One, mm -hmm. Evernote, and Brain Honey. Yeah. And there and I mean there were probably others. I must say that you know. My boyfriend and I, we had sort of big plans to ask everybody, and I think after walking like two steps into the exhibit hall, I was like, okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah I was expecting sort of <laughs> these surreptitious videos of, you know, and the kind of the man on the street where people look at you like they don't even know what an API is. And, and a lot of them didn't. And But I think that that was actually, to me, that's also really indicative. Someone said, you're the first person that's ever asked us this question, and that Again, I think that that makes me, of course, that makes me angry at the company that they have no plan for, for data portability. But again, I think it also, let's, I mean, it sort of points this back to we need educators to be more than just tech enthusiasts, enthusiasts and educators need to start asking these questions as well. Audrey Waters, the Richard Stallman of the 2010s. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that there's, something really important there. Yeah, I mean, it, and, you know, there are a couple of the shared learning collaborative, for example, the Gates Foundation funded um, initiative is trying to help build some infrastructure around this. There are a couple of startups that also recognize that we need to be able to get some of these systems to talk to one another, be able to get data in and out of legacy systems. But I, th I think in the interim, it's really important for us to just be smarter, smarter consumers. Okay, you did a, uh, an app review. I did for Key Graham. How, how does storytelling seem to change with age? I thought that you know this is Launchpad Toys were one of my picks for my favorite startups of 2011, um, and they they have an app called Toontastic, which is a fun little 
um, storytelling app that allows kids to sort of make their own cartoon movies. And it really helps kids think about how do you write a story? How do you think, you know, how do you have sort of dramatic intensity? Um, and they've seen a huge adoption of this, but they noticed um, that as kids got older, that there was like, the, as kids got older, their stories got a lot more, um, a lot more elaborate, and then there was sort of a sudden fall off as uh, um, once they reached their teens, and they found that teens were just telling different stories, and in some ways, those stories that teens tell takes place in Facebook status updates. It takes place over text messaging, and so they sort of. They sort of tweaked the, the Toontastic app somewhat to sort of see if they could tap into the text messaging Facebook status um, like update by using the same sort of animation idea. So I thought that this was a really fun way of thinking about, again, coming back to this thing, thinking about online writing too. Like, are, you know, how are we really recognizing the storytelling that kids, that, that teens do? Um, because they are still telling stories. They just don't look like the stories that you write when you're in second grade. They have zombies in them. They do. They have zombies <laughs> in them, apparently. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> okay, so the irony of this next story, the irony of you getting Android gear. I mean, really, <laughs> come on. The, the, the Nexus Q and the 7, the, uh -huh. you know, my hands are itching. <laughs> How is this possible that you are getting this gear? I know. Well, I the the new the new Android phone looks looks pretty interesting. The um, the 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 Android tablet, Google's Android tablet, seems like a much nicer um, device than the than the Kindle Fire, which is as you remember, I, I actually sent back to Amazon. I think that I think that Google's created with with its with its tablet. I think it's onto something. Um, but I don't think it's an education device, and I think that actually arguing that it should or shouldn't be misses the point of what, of yeah, what so there Google's was, doing. There was some criticism that education wasn't really mentioned, and your response to this was, wait a minute, Google is contributing incredibly to education. Right. So the way that so I so I've spent this week, um, I spent you know the beginning of the week at ISTE and now um, the rest of the week at, at Google I/O, which is its annual developer conference. And day one, the keynote um, was a lot of these Android updates. They unveiled the latest Android operating system, their tablet, this um, strange device called the Nexus Q. Um, the most, really, the most incredible product demo I've ever seen for their Project Glass, these new um, glasses that, that they're working on that involved skydiving. Um, but, but day one is always about Android, and day two is about the web. And so uh, Joshua Kim from Inside Higher Ed at the end of day one said, wow, you've really blown it, Google. Why haven't you made, and why, have, why didn't you mention education? Don't you want an Android tablet for education. You could be doing all of these things on a tablet. Um, don't you care? And my response was that Google absolutely cares. But when Google talks about education, they talk about the web. And I think, I mean, you know, Google's placed bets on both native apps and the mobile web. Um, but I think that when, when you look at what Google's doing in education, it's all about the web. Uh, and I think that that's that's what was day two of the Google I.O. keynote. But certainly I think that, and I think to me at least, that's where we should be thinking about our focus as well. Not just Google's focus, but the, the focus of the web. Rather than being too concerned about a proprietary operating system or an open source operating system, but one that only works on certain devices, um, whether it's iOS or Android, I think we're missing the we're missing an opportunity to really have things that are accessible by anybody with an internet um, that has internet connectivity. And that's the web. The promise of the web to me is where we should be thinking about our energies because of issues of access, issues of cross-platform support. So Apple's clearly making a killing, yes. right? And they're incredibly popular, as we've talked about in mm -hmm. in schools and especially at these tech conferences. Mm -hmm. Is uh, how do we reconcile Google's sort of behind the scenes openness and their ed programs and limit very limited staff? 
at these events and the ultimate impact? Yeah, I know. I mean, I think that this, it's it's really interesting too. Um, I mean, and I think the other player that we should talk about here is Microsoft as well, because you know, Microsoft. I mean, all of these three companies all seem to be, sort of be um, selling both being interested either overtly or subtly in the education market. Um, Microsoft was, of course, a tier one sponsor of ISTE um, and ha had its own set of booths in a separate room. Um, and I think that, you know, thinking about, you know, what is it that we want from these big technology companies? Do we want their hardware? And is this, I mean, is really, are we really going to focus on hardware or are we going to focus on sort of what, what, how you're using technology in the classroom. I mean, and again, like, I feel like sometimes we get so caught up in the hardware, so caught up with these shiny devices, that we forget to ask the questions of what are we actually doing? Why, why would you want students to have access to an internet-connected um, computing device? Whatever shape it is. So there's really nothing about Google strategy here which is screaming profit to me. Right? I mean, I'm certainly my... Most of what Google does here doesn't really translate into sellable products. Mm -hmm. Am I missing something? I mean, or, or is this just a, 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 the nature of their business? Or are they making a conscious choice not to be sort of in in a mode where they're creating products I mean, like the Chromebook, where they're, they're it really seems like they're really pushing or promoting something to sell to education? I think that this is. I mean, I would. I have this question about a lot of things that Google does. I mean, clearly Google makes a ton of money through what is all what's been traditionally its business, right? Which is sort of advertising through search. Um, and that's, that is still, I think, the cash cow for Google. I'm not clear how much money they're making licensing Android. I'm not clear how much money they're making through something like YouTube, which again is a huge, which we shouldn't ignore the importance of YouTube right now in conversations around education. Um, and so I think it's really hard. I mean, for me, it's really hard to, to, to think about um, where Google's interests are, where Google's financial interests are, other than, other than having us, all the all forces sort of are driving us towards, which are driving us towards Google, the search engine, and the ad revenue that comes from that. Or, or is this a case of just they're believing that that what they're doing will be good for education? They're not going to spend a lot of money you know, necessarily promoting that, but ultimately a belief that what's good for the world will be good for educators? I think that, I mean, I think that is, I think that that is true. And I think that you can see that by, in the willingness to sort of give thing, give products away without licensing fees, um, to spend a lot of time. And one of the things that really strikes me about, always strikes me about the Google booth, um, and this is, I think, only the third year Google's exhibited at ISTE, um, is that it's, that although there are Googlers there, that there are a lot of teachers giving demos on how to use Google products, how they use Google products in their own classes. And to me, again, that's a really different focus on how the tools are being used by teachers as opposed to how a vendor thinks you should use its tool. So do I need to give you my mailing address now or later? <laughs> Okay, the University of Virginia does a major flip around here. They sure do. They reinstated after um, earlier this month firing Teresa Sullivan because they claimed that she was an incrementalist and not changing quickly enough. Um, they reinstated her unanimously with a vote with a vote this week. This was a fascinating story at many levels, yes. in part because of the community voice, but also because the community voice was so absent at the beginning. Right, which was, I think, part of, I mean, I think that it's really interesting to think about all of this happening at the University of Virginia, too, which has a very strong, um, a very strong set of core beliefs that, um, as a university community. It has a strong alumni um, 
uh, has a lot of alumni who clearly really care. Um, but also, this was a university founded by Thomas Jefferson. And so you really get to make an argument about the meaning of public, the meaning of the university uh, system at a sort of a larger and historic level. So this was interesting. This was a very interesting and, and, um, and I was very relieved to see um, the reversal, but I think it's, you know, I think we're still going to have to watch um, these machinations as they are unfolding at other universities, of the other public universities uh, across the country, too. I've been trying to figure out what the photograph <laughs> is for this story. It's like, it looks like maybe it's tied to the lawn. Yes. It's, where, like, <laughs> it's, it's the grass. Lawn. It's obviously grass. And the grass, right? I was thinking close of up. The, the, the grass is always greener sort of thing, too. So funny or new growth or there you go. something okay so uh, in louisiana the governor signed a law eliminating state funding for public libraries yeah i don't even i couldn't even come up with a comment to that i'm fascinated by this i mean and i think it's but it is i guess what it is worth noting that just a couple of weeks ago we talked about um st the state's plan to privatize the public school system as well Wow. Okay. Uh, um, Girls who code. Yeah, this was this was um, a, an announcement that was interesting that it was picked up by the New York Times um, because there are lots of organizations that are out there supporting young women becoming more interested in engineering careers. But uh, Girls Who Code is a new organization that has the support of Twitter, Google eBay and GE that are going to um, help support uh, with mentoring and uh, teaching programs to get more girls interested in programming. And I must say, having spent the last three days at Google I.O., where the line for the men's bathroom goes down the hall and around, and there's never a line in the women's bathroom, that <laughs> it's more important than ever that, I mean, it's, it was really striking to me. I to see at, at Google I.O. with 6,000 attendees, I'm guessing perhaps 1% of attendees were women. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tell us about Clever coming out of stealth this week. Yeah, Clever, um, Clever is one of these companies that's looking to sort of address this question of data portability. Um, they're very similar to LearnSprout, which is a company I covered a couple of weeks ago. They want to be able to develop APIs that connect some of these legacy school systems to other app developers. Um, I know this is an area in which I know very little, but is the, I think uh, before the other LearnSprout, the idea was that there was a uh, some kind of a free and then a charge. I'm trying to remember what that yeah, was. And does not, Clever have a I'm model not, here? I'm not clear what what their model what their model is going to be. So I need to find out more about them. Okay. Uh, uh, Microsoft changes the name of its service of the, in the terms of service of its email and productivity suite. Uh, now Office 365 and free for students. This is you know. Uh, Microsoft and Google are clearly sort of in a battle for, I mean, in general, for who's who, for the for using productivity uh, for the suite of productivity tools, um, and Microsoft really hasn't been keeping up with Google. Part, I mean, for no other reason perhaps um, than Google Apps for Education is free, um, and whereas Live at Edu offered free email but charged for access to, um, they charged a, a license, um, and they charged for access to the, the, the Office 365. But they're rebranding and going to make it free for, free for students. So it'll be interesting to see if that, if that sort of changes the momentum, um, if, if Microsoft is able to sort of regain momentum in the education space. For some reason, I just can't see that happening. I mean, feel like um, uh, Google's done sort of a brilliant job of playing the disruptive innovation. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, simpler, fewer uh, capabilities, but uh, meets the needs of an outlying audience and then grows and grows and gets more and more popular. I, I just don't feel, I mean, help me to understand if you think differently, but I don't see Microsoft being relevant here. Well, I think that, I think that, 
there are still pl plenty of schools who are reluctant to move to the cloud in general. And I think that there are lots of schools who have fears of security, security and privacy issues. And I do think that Microsoft is probably going to play, um, play on those fears, fears of the cloud and fears, um, privacy fears, in sort of trying to sell itself or position itself as different from Google, even though I don't, I mean, I, I don't think that that's really an accurate portrayal. I mean, Google doesn't, you know, Google doesn't data mine your, your school's email. Google doesn't, or Google doesn't sell ads against Google Apps for Education. But I think it's still sort of the fear that that's, a lot of people have that fear of Google because of its, because of free Gmail, that if they go, if they go Google, that suddenly all of their stuff will be exposed to, uh, to Google. I guess I didn't speak very clearly there as well. I, I just don't see Office 365 as a free oh. cloud offering being competitive. Yeah. I, again, I am intrigued here by two companies that have very different strategies. Mm -hmm. Microsoft spends an enormous amount of money marketing to schools. Right. Right. And, and Google, I'm guessing, doesn't do any of that kind of... Um, I'm, I'm going to just be careful about my words here, but you know that kind of throwing of money around. I think it was last year the University of Nebraska, Microsoft actually paid the University of Nebraska to adopt live at EDU, which I guess is a good deal if you can get it for the university. Interesting. Okay, so tell me about uh, Open Study offering certificates. This is a strange development, um, and it's, it's hard to know um, what the rationale behind it is. Um, I've been following Open Study for a long time. They're really they are an interesting startup. They were one of the very first to sort of make a place for these sort of massive online study groups. They worked closely with MIT OpenCourseWare, for example, to offer study groups for some of some of those uh, resources. Um, and they've just announced today that they're going to start offering certificates so that people can highlight what they've done, um, how they've participated in these groups. Um, and sort of when I click through on the message, it looks as though they're going to be charging people $50 a piece um, for those. And it's hard for me to see how that, that I don't know. I mean, it's too soon to tell, um, I suppose. And it, perhaps this is sort of their plan to, um, to monetize the site. But I, I can't imagine, I mean, $50 for, to show that you've participated in a, in a study group seems pretty steep. And it, and I have to wonder too if it changes, the, if it changes the meaning of participating in open study. There have been a lot of people I think who sort of you help out other, you help out your fellow learners in open study. And I have to wonder now if adding a, adding a certificate and a paid certificate and sort of formalizing that informal learning and sharing will 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 change the tenor of what happens there. Yeah, I had a hard time going down this thought path, right? Because certificates, and you pay for the certificate, and I thought about badges, right? Right, and oftentimes you're actually paying for a course that's going to produce the badge for you. Mm -hmm. So is that really is that really any different? But then my question was, so who really cares if you participated in a study group? Right. I mean, I and I don't know if this is sort of if this is open study banking on the fact that more and more we will be turning more and more to rather than formal degrees, if employers were, will start recognizing these um, certificates in inform, like the, uh, recognizing informal learning more formally? I don't know. Well, okay. I, again, I'm going to be a little snarky here, but uh, nobody's giving us a badge to do this podcast <laughs> right, or a certificate. I mean, it's sort of, it's a, it's a part of our professional work that then is documented as professional work. Would it be enhanced by somebody providing us with some kind of certificate that we did it? I know. I mean, I, I think that, I think that for us, the the documentation of what we do is the thing we did, <laughs> right? Okay, so, there we go. Right. So we don't actually need to have. We don't need. We don't need a certificate. We don't need a badge for this because we can actually provide a link to. You know, we can show the RSS feed. We can provide a the mp3 file of this podcast and say here's proof take a listen like it or leave it but here here's our example which is a which i think is the power of an online portfolio and it, that we don't need to to have a badge system or a certificate system around these sorts of things 
Okay, this we have to turn this into a meme. <laughs> Say it again. Was it the proof of what we did is what we did? <laughs> yes. Is that what you said? Yes. <laughs> okay, we are declaring this um, an Audrey meme. Okay, so uh, at the keynote today with Dan Rather here in New York, uh, he was speaking to a room full of teachers and spent a good portion of his time talking about how the United States, the teaching pool in the United States is of significantly low quality and, um, and how in other countries they're much more selective and do a much better job of getting high quality teachers. This was one of those obvious cases of a keynote speaker not being prepped with an understanding of the audience he was speaking to. <laughs> yeah. You and I both felt this when uh, LeVar Burton spoke at uh, South by Southwest. Right. And to a large group of sort of entrepreneurial non-educators talking about how – as though they were all educators. Yeah. Uh, and then you had some concerns about the Reading Rainbow as an app. Right. But mitigated now a little bit maybe by the fact that all the original shows are available on YouTube? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, a lot of folks, and it, it's, it's hard. I mean, and I feel this myself. It's actually hard not to, to love LeVar Burton. I mean, this, you know, I think of so many touch points in my life where he's done, you know, he's, he's, he's really impacted me, whether it was in Roots or, um, or in Star Trek The Next Generation or in Reading Rainbow it's hard not to like him and it was really interesting to watch a really very enthusiastic um, press none of whom asked sort of what I thought were sort of some of the difficult questions about um, ethic uh, sort of about 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 equity and access around taking what was a free television show on public TV um, and putting it on an iPad the, and charging people a per month subscription free to get access to books when really at the end of Reading Rainbow was always this, this, this moment where he would urge kids to go to the public library. Like if you like books, go to the public library. And so I was, if, to me it felt, I was just disappointed that there wasn't any, nobody sort of asked, someone did it South by Southwest, but in the write-up of the new app, nobody sort of pressed him on that and, and, because, you know, this... Uh, I mean, especially in light of, you know, Bobby Jindal closing the libraries, I mean, when we talk about access to books, we have to, you know, we have to think about that, we have to think about equity as well. But the, I guess, someone has taken and put all, put all those old shows up on YouTube, so if you feel the need to listen to LeVar Burton tell you to go to the library, now you can do so via YouTube without paying $10 a month uh, to listen to his voice on an app. Yeah, I feel the same way about him. I, in fact, I, I almost called him Jordy LaForge. Got could to contain that would, would not have come out of my mouth, but certainly he has um, uh, made a big difference for a lot of us. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, there's a New York Times report on a Google project simulating the human brain. Yeah, this is really fascinating, particularly in light of some of the things I've been thinking about lately in terms of automating human learning. But a, a, a research project at Google has actually um, around machine learning, which you know, which is um, uh, machine learning is this process of sort of training computers with algorithms to be able to sort of um, improve improve their outcomes, um, which which we call learning. But it actually appeared though after um, that these researchers were able to um, get a computer to to recognize cats based on showing them YouTube videos over and over and over. That without teaching without teaching the computer what a cat is or or programming a computer to identify cat cat these computer a computer learned cat and it's a interesting and somehow frightening frightening breakthrough i think i can't wait to read that in in uh in part the first thing i thought of was autism mm -hmm. and some of the difficulties that those uh with more severe autism have in actually getting to that level of abstraction right right that can't, can't, that's that's going to be very interesting i think as we move into this era uh, David Wiley uh, has identified an open textbook deployment model. Yeah, he's been working in Utah, of course, with um, um, working with the open textbooks there, and he's reached, he's just published um, an article with some of his findings 
you know, I mean, and he, he, he notes that, it, that just because you're using um, openly licensed materials doesn't mean that you're actually saving time or money, in part because for teachers who spend a lot of time actually um, uh, mixing up and editing and, uh, and, and, and changing, changing the texts, it is actually, um, they actually spend sort of more time and money than, um, than they would with a proprietary textbook. Um, but the, he's found that, you know, using a certain model, they are able to save, save about 50% over traditional proprietary textbook implementations. And I think that that's, you know, I think it's Im important to recognize here that just because you're using free and openly licensed material in the classroom, that doesn't mean that the cost is nothing, that there are other costs. There are other costs with using anything. And other benefits. Well, true. So um, I was at a conference with David, and he talked about one of the great benefits of open textbooks is the ability every year to change mm -hmm. the course material to match sort of new thinking or, or the ways in which the teachers want to teach. And we've put our money, so to speak, where our mouth is, and we've enrolled our soon-to-be ninth-grade daughter in the open uh, high, high school. school of Utah. Oh, cool. So we're, we're looking forward to kind of watching that. It, 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 and where we live right now in Park City, the high school doesn't actually start till 10th grade. So this is a year she's going into ninth grade where we actually thought this might be kind of fun to try. Yeah. Okay, so um, the Internet has crowdfunded the bullied bus monitor Karen Klein to the tune of $666,000? I wasn't able to sit through the video that someone captured of these um, young kids bullying her. Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty harsh stuff. I think also thinking, I mean, just thinking in general about, you know, these questions of sort of, of how we behave with one another online or offline interesting to see a step up and um, people sort of step up and, and, and donate um, to, to send her on, uh, on a vacation initially, but um, uh, retire now. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's an interesting response to, I think, what's probably a, a, a much bigger problem. But those folks, felt, folks can feel good, I suppose, knowing that they, that they helped this particular woman out. Okay, so uh, Hub Edu is um, let's see, is it spun off of Rafter? No, we're or acquired? acquired acquired by Rafter. So Rafter, um, Rafter, which was actually spun out of Book Renter, um, has made its first acquisition. I think trying to shore up some of the services around offering sort of this digital course materials um, to to universities. I'd never heard of Hub Edu before the acquisition, so it's hard to know if this is a talent acquisition or if there was some technology that they were using. Again, this is the price comparison mm -hmm. kind of feature set, which uh, you know, um, a little out of my, well, out of my area of expertise. So curious. In the same way that I feel this sort of mixed feeling about the um, open textbooks, mm -hmm. wondering how long an actual physical textbook. Right. Is going to last. Uh, I just don't. I you know. I feel like a, this is a little out of my area of understanding. You know, sort of the price comparison textbook. I just want things to kind of switch immediately. I know <laughs> it won't happen, but okay. San Diego School District uh, does a number of very interesting things here, um, both financially and with iPads. The the big headline this week was that the that the school district will now have the largest iPad deployment in the country in K twelve. They're spending fifteen million dollars to buy twenty six thousand iPads, and that sort of was all she wrote for a lot of the headlines. And I think I just had I just had to throw in some of the other things that are happening, particularly since you know California, the state of California in general, um, the um, education budgets are being slashed. Um, incredibly, and the the San Diego school district is actually has a hundred and fifty million dollar budget shortfall for this year, so for next year. So they've come up with fifteen million dollars for iPads. Meanwhile, the teachers have agreed not to take any pay raises for um, for two years. They'll have five unpaid furlough days. The school year is nineteen days shorter, but. Um, I guess we're supposed to cheer that they will now all now twenty six thousand students will have iPads. So, 
Yeah, again, uh, sort of fascinating decision making. And and for me, in the context of all we've talked about today, hard not to look at that and recognize the profit motive for Apple. Right. Right. I mean, I, I think that that's, I mean, that's, you know, I think that that's clearly, that's, you know, that's clearly Apple, Apple is, is doing very well with this excitement that, that excitement that schools have about their devices. And meanwhile, schools aren't doing very well at all when it comes to, when it comes to their budgets. Google is jumping on the MOOC bandwagon. Yeah, which was a little painful with that their press release described MOOCs as the learning format pioneered by Stanford and MIT. Um, so once again, um, the, the Canadians have been written out of, <laughs> written out of that, the history of education technology there. Um, but they're offering a they're offering a, a class on power searching with Google, which I think actually sounds pretty interesting. I, I saw the write up of of a keynote that Google's uh, anthropologists of search gave at a journalism conference um, early earlier this week, and some fascinating tricks that I certainly didn't know about. Like I mean, being able to find uh, being able to find all sorts of information that. We're, we're well beyond. I mean, I consider myself a fairly, you know, fairly adept user of Google. But being able to looking at a photo and being able to find the phone number for the building in the photo, and so seeing all sorts of interesting things. So well, Dan Russell's kind of famous for those puzzlers, right? Yes. Yes. And I'm still hoping Google will will want to do this Search Matters virtual conference with me because I really think that kind of a, a Broader focus from teachers and, and recorded resources uh, just makes so much sense, and they do such a good job with this. Yeah. Um, Saul Khan tells the Chronicle of Higher Ed, I'm guessing. The yes. Chronicle? No. Yes. That, that those who criticize him for mistakes in his videos are a bit arrogant and disparaging. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was too easy a sound bite. Well, I. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is actually, I think, pretty troubling because a couple of, a couple of uh, university math professors, John Golden and David Coffey, made a parody video uh, in, the, in the sort of in the style of Mystery Science Theater 3000 in which they projected a Khan Academy video and they gave a running commentary and noticed the things that um, Sal got wrong about, um, about, and just questions about how, how you teach. And to, to his credit, he pulled the video. Um, but now it's sort of been picked up in the press, um, uh, picked up in the press, and, and, it, and Sal's response was pretty nasty, I thought, um, suggesting, that, suggesting that someone, you know, that, that these teachers, or that someone like Dan Meyer, who I think has been a pretty outspoken critic of, of, of Khan Academy's methodology for a while, I'm um, just suggest that, that that it's arrogant or disparaging to ask a video be accurate and pedagogically appropriate is um, I thought was a a, a pretty revealing comment uh, a, a pretty revealing comment from Saul Khan, frankly. Especially, I mean, I'm not going to attribute this to Saul necessarily, but a lot of the discussion around these kind of hosted videos. Uh, on education have been that you would have access to the best. Right. Right? Yeah, and I'm not saying that Saul's necessarily said his videos are the best, but there is sort of this larger movement of this idea that by, by going online, you're actually going to get the best information and, and certainly not, not necessarily the most thoughtful response. Right. Okay, and finally, we get to wrap up this extra long show with more <laughs> robot graders. Yay! Something that makes Audrey super excited for the future of education <laughs> technology is that the Hewlett Foundation is kicking down $50,000 this time to ha have data scientists come up with the best way to automate the grading of short answers. So they recently sponsored a contest, $100,000 for essays. They're offering fifty thousand dollars if you can automate um, short responses. So not not that any of the countries who are succeeding uh, worldwide in education are doing any kind of uh, multiple choice or short answer or robot grading. We certainly are going to lead the field. I think. 
Right. And if there's one thing that clearly our school system is missing is efficiency that robots will provide us. So that's a future we can all look forward to. Okay. <laughs> Lovely, Audrey. Thank you again for all that you do. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Okay. Bye now. Bye.